Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, the manufacture of ACR coils with smaller diameter copper tubes. This event, brought to you by the ACHR News and Appliance Design Magazine, is sponsored by International Copper Association and Micro Group. I'm your moderator, Kyle Gregero, Kyle Gregero, editor of the News Magazine. Thanks for joining us. Today's expert presenters are John Hipchin and Ned Halet. John has over 14 years of experience with heat exchanger technologies including the marketing of copper alloys, as well as manufacturing technologies for brazing and soldering. Previously, he managed the development of new markets for specialized equipment systems. John graduated from Loyola University in Chicago and has spent his early career working as a chemist. Ned has served as the Vice President of Sales for Burr Oak Tool since 2001. He has been employed at Burr Oak Tool for 40 years, the first 15 as a project engineer, the remaining time in sales and management. His present responsibility in sales is for the Pacific Rim market. Before we begin the presentation, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. At the bottom middle of your screen, you will see a taskbar. Each icon on the taskbar is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. If you are unsure about what an icon does, hover over the icon with your mouse and a box will pop up that tells you the function. If you wish to minimize the PowerPoint presentation, click the X on the far left-hand side of the taskbar on the slide window. Click the slides icon in the taskbar to regain that screen. You can use this function to minimize any panels on your viewing screen. Just remember, if you wish to regain the panel once you've removed it, just double click on the icon in the taskbar. If you would like to tweet about this webinar, please click on the T icon and use the hashtag poundnewswebinars. You may submit your question to the presenter by submitting a question in the designated Q&A area. If you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to email us by clicking on the help icon. Today's event is being recorded and archived on achrnews.com. All registered participants will receive an email within one or two business days that has a link to view a recording of this event. And now, I'm excited to turn it over to today's first presenter. Please welcome John. Thank you. On behalf of the International Copper Association and all its affiliates and copper centers around the world, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar. As Kyle mentioned, my name is John Hipshin, and I'm one of the presenters today. This is the International Copper Association's third webinar discussing the industry trend towards smaller diameter copper tubes, known as microgroove tubes. Past webinars have focused heavily on microgroove technology and we've delved into details about the reduction of boundary layers and the heat transfer advantages that come from the increased surface area of small diameter microgroove tubes. We've covered in detail case studies that demonstrated the performance and cost reducing benefits of microgroove tubes, and that's due to lower material use, lower refrigerant charge, and more compact air conditioning and refrigeration units. Past webinars are archived on the microgroove.net website, along with additional information, such as technical papers and resources related to the use of microgroove tubes. And today's webinar is also going to be archived at microgroove.net. In today's webinar, we're going to take a few minutes to review the basic technology behind microgroove tubes, and then we're going to focus on manufacturing. We'll discuss production practices for air conditioning and refrigeration coils using conventional tube sizes. And then we'll talk about building coils with small diameter microgroove tubes. We'll identify the challenges involved in manufacturing coils with smaller diameter tubes. And we'll learn about the manufacturing solutions that are being successfully used to overcome those challenges. And we're most fortunate today to have the assistance of Burr Oak Tool Incorporated. They're often referred to across the globe simply as oak. Burr Oak Tool is a leading manufacturer of coil production equipment. And if you've ever been inside a coil manufacturing plant, chances are real good that you've seen machinery built by Burr Oak Tool. Because when it comes to building air conditioning and refrigeration coils with round tubes, Burr Oak builds machinery that covers every aspect of the production process. And that includes thin lines and thin dies, tube benders and tube cutoff machines, tube expanders, and coil form machines that can bend finished coils to very exact dimensions. We'll discuss the coil production process and all of the machinery in a few minutes. But first, let's review the basic technology behind the use of microgroove tubes 
And let's talk about why the industry is moving toward the use of smaller diameter copper tubes. And I apologize if you're already familiar with this technology, but for those who are not, this will show rather quickly why the industry is moving in this direction. To make sure we're all on the same page, the type of coils we'll be talking about today are round copper tube flat fin coils. They're used in a number of applications that cover residential, commercial, and industrial settings. These coils can be condensers, evaporators, water heating coils, and a number of other heat exchanger uses. Round tube plate fin coils have been around for over 100 years, and there's good reasons why they're still in use today. What we'll see in the next few slides is that these reliable, older designs are evolving into newer, much more efficient designs that use smaller diameter, internally enhanced copper tubes that we call microgroove tubes. Microgroove tubes produce two phenomena that are largely responsible for all of the advantages and benefits that are pushing this evolution of copper tube plate thin coils. Because of reduced boundary layers and increased surface area, microgroove tubes result in dramatic heat transfer advantage. And this allows the engineers that design ACR coils to do a number of things that cannot be done with larger diameter tubes or with flat tubes. The name microgroove refers directly to both of these phenomena. Micro, referring to the smaller diameter tubes and the increased surface area that results from the smaller diameters. And groove refers to the internal enhancements inside the tube that reduce boundary layers. So the name microgroove means internally enhanced smaller diameter tubes. And today, microgroove tubes are commercially available in diameters down to five millimeters but there is work being done on yet smaller diameters. So future discussions about microgroove tubes could very well involve diameters smaller than five millimeters. Whenever fluid moves through a tube, the fluid closest to the tube wall behaves differently than the fluid in the center of the tube. And the fluid next to the tube wall sets up a boundary layer. And in the boundary layer, heat transfer becomes more difficult. And this applies to the hydraulic motion of fluid as well as the way heat moves from the center of the tube to the tube wall. Fluid closest to the tube wall tends to move slower than the fluid in the center. And even in turbulent flow, a laminar sublayer forms and heat moves slower through these boundary layers than it does in the faster moving fluid toward the center of the tube. These boundary layers act as an insulator and they interfere with the heat transfer that we want. And in this slide you can see the boundary layer in a smooth tube develops and it does not dissipate or go away. Microgroove tubes have internal enhancements and grooves that reduce the formation of boundary layers. You can see that the boundary layer begins to develop, but it breaks down as it moves over the grooves. The additional mixing of the refrigerant that occurs inside the tube because of these grooves increases the amount of refrigerant that comes in contact with the tube wall. And the positive effect on heat transfer from these internal enhancements has been known for a long time and it's been applied commercially for over 20 years. And when that's combined with smaller diameter tubes, we have even more advantages we want to take a closer look at. The enhancements inside of microgroove tubes are proprietary patterns that tube manufacturers put on the inside tube wall. And the exact configuration of the internal grooves and patterns is based on a long history of technical development and design, and it's backed up by both experimental and field performance data. And this data clearly shows significant advantages to microgroove tubes. So now let's look at what happens when we combine the increased efficiency of internal enhancements with smaller tube diameters. When we compare tubes of different diameters, one of the first things we notice is that it takes several smaller diameter tubes to equal the surface area that we have in a larger diameter tube. But this is not a disadvantage. 
we actually have important benefits here, and a big one is an increase in the surface area to volume ratio, and that equates to more heat transfer. And with this increase in heat transfer, we don't need to match the volume of the surface area, the larger tube, to get the same amount of cooling. Using smaller diameter tubes, we can actually match the cooling of the larger tube with less volume. And that also means less refrigerant. Another benefit is that in a smaller diameter tube, we can hold the same pressure as a larger diameter tube, but we can do it with thinner tube walls. And there are case studies that clearly demonstrate how important this can be to the overall cost of a system. So when we reduce tube diameters, we can actually reduce the weight of the materials being used, and that in turn reduce costs. And as we continue to reduce tube diameters, we continue to gain surface area in relation to the amount of refrigerant that we have in the tube. And we can continue to reduce tube wall thicknesses while still meeting the same pressure criteria as the larger tube. If we happen to be dealing with higher pressures, as many of the newer refrigerants require, we can handle higher pressures in smaller diameter tubes with thinner tube walls than a larger tube would require. The bottom line is that we can do a lot more with considerably less material. This photo represents a real life example of what we just reviewed, and it's taken out of a catalog on the internet. And the new design in this picture shows smaller diameter tubes that provide 35% more passes, which will result in considerably more heat transfer. But you'll notice that the tubes in the, new, in the new design are arranged in a staggered pattern, and that again will improve the efficiency of the coil. And this ability to arrange the tubes in more efficient geometric patterns is yet another advantage of round copper tubes. So we want to turn your attention now to manufacturing. But before we do, let's quickly review the benefits of smaller diameter microgroup tubes. There are a number of reasons why coil manufacturers are modifying their lines for smaller diameter tubes, and this list gives us a quick snapshot. The improved heat transfer technology that we just discussed results in more energy efficient, smaller and lighter coils. And it brings about all of these benefits to air conditioning and refrigeration systems. Keep in mind that each of these benefits is not only associated with meeting energy and refrigerant regulations, these regulations do continue to change, but each benefit also means cost reductions. And advantages like less refrigerant and less material are especially important to cost reduction programs. And these benefits are oftentimes the driving force behind new designs. So let's turn now toward the technology behind manufacturing air conditioning and refrigeration coils with conventional tubes and with smaller diameter microgroup tubes. I'm going to turn the webinar over to Ned Halet now from Burr Oak Tool Incorporated. Thanks, John. We certainly appreciate this opportunity. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ned Halet, Vice President of Sales for Burr Oak Tool. With us today is Randy Seibel, our Research and Development Manager, and he'll be helping us with questions and answers later. We'll be discussing the general manufacturing process of heat exchanger coils with small diameter tubing such as 5 millimeters. Baroque Tool has been in business since 1944 and building production machinery for the air conditioning and heating market since the mid-1950s. We have an office in the Czech Republic to provide support for our European and Middle East clients one in India for that specific market and also one in China. We have sales representatives in Mexico, Brazil, Korea, Japan, and Thailand, but all of the manufacturing is performed here in our original factory in Sturgis, Michigan. We have supplied production machinery to air conditioning and heating facilities in more than 70 countries on just about every continent. John mentioned earlier the industry trend toward round copper tubes with smaller diameters, and at Baroque, we actually started dealing with this trend years ago when manufacturers started replacing half-inch tubes with 3 8 in the 1960s. 
And then more recently, 3 8 diameters are being replaced with 5 16 and 7 millimeter designs. As we just saw in the previous slides, there are good reasons to, to reduce tube diameters even further. And many of our customers are now turning to us and other equipment manufacturers for equipment that can produce redesigned coils with 5 millimeter diameter microgroove copper tubes. So we're going to take the next few minutes to look more closely at coil manufacturing in general, and more specifically at what it takes to manufacture coils with tubes as small as 5 millimeter in diameter. Our first order of business will be to provide a quick review of the four basic areas of heat exchanger production. These are fin stamping, tube processing, fin handling and lacing, and finally expansion. Once we have finished discussing all four of these basic processes, we will have a nearly complete heat exchanger, but it won't be quite ready for installation. Your manufacturing process will also include a brazing operation to seal all the joints, and some applications require that the flat coil that has just been produced be then formed into a particular shape, such as an L or a U. For today's discussion, we'll concentrate on these four primary processes. This slide shows a representative fin line, including an uncoiling system, lubrication method, press, die, suction unit, and stacking mechanism. These are available in various sizes and levels of complexity, but essentially all lines perform the same function, the production of fins and the placement of these fins into a specific arrangement or stack. This stack is then manually removed and taken to the lacing area. Well, various fin stock materials can be used. Primarily the material of choice is aluminum, but there are also applications such as marine or coastal environments or antimicrobial characteristics that require the use of a totally copper coil. Mild and stainless steel is sometimes used as fin stock in corrosive atmospheres. The stock comes in various widths depending on the number of rows of the fin die and the tonnage capacity of the press. The size of the fin die and press combination is governed by your production requirements. Our present presses have 30 ton, 60 ton, 100 ton, and 160 ton capacities and can support increasingly wider material. The increasing tonnage also reflects an increasing capital equipment price, but the real question is the price per hole produced. If high production rates are required, a larger, more expensive press can manufacture fins more efficiently, actually providing a lower total cost per hole. The suction unit provides the support for the fin before it reaches its correct length and is cut. The stacker mechanism comes in many different styles and collects and maintains these cut fins in a vertical stack in preparation to their removal when the stack is complete. The fin line supports the fin die, the actual tooling that determines the configuration of the fin itself. It is a progressive type die and can be either a draw or an extrude design. Let's discuss these definitions for a minute. A progressive die is one that moves the material in specific increments, performing a unique task at the end of each transition. In the fin die, the following are the usual transitions, or what we often call stations. There's the draw, which governs the, ma the material for the collar. The pierce, making the collar whole, the flare, which determines the final collar height, the edge trim, finishing the outside edges of the fin stock, the slit, determining the number of rows wide in each fin, the feed, providing the movement of the fin stock to the die, and the cutoff, which makes the correct length of fin. A draw type die is one that uses a technology of gathering material in a series of steps to provide the collar height. This process allows the easy adjustment of a fairly wide range of collar heights and the use of various fin stock thicknesses. An extrude type die, also called drawless, uses a thinning process to form the collar height. This technique is useful when processing fin stock that has a very hard temper or low elasticity characteristics. There are appropriate applications for either style of die. Many aluminum fin stocks are also coated with anti-corrosive or hydrophilic material. These can be abrasive to fin dies unless the tooling is properly prepared with appropriate high wear steels. 
Another major requirement of the fin die is to provide accurate and consistent collar heights for these fins. These collars actually establish the spacing of one fin to another. This specification is relative to the application for which the coil is being used. For instance, refrigeration applications may require quite tall collars, increasing the spacing between fins, while air conditioning applications generally use shorter designs. The surface area between the pattern holes is subject to a vast array of designs. Some fin configurations are solid with different types of topography, such as a sine wave and V-waffle forms as shown in the upper portion of this slide. Others, as shown in the lower portion, use cuts in the fin surface to either redirect the airflow or to create turbulence to enhance the heat transfer characteristics of the fin. Depending on the shape of the fin, these are called louvers or lances and can be installed in a surface form. In the tube processing portion of this sequence, we include hairpin benders, straight tube cutoff machines, and return bend equipment. The hairpin bender provides the long 180 degree bends for insertion into the heat exchanger coil and is generally comprised of an uncoiling system, feed and cutoff unit, and bending mechanism. Straightening is performed in the feed area and has been done until recently, generally by a roller system. The cutting of the tubing is done by an oscillating tool and does not produce chips or scrap. Removal of the finished hairpin from the work area is primarily performed manually, but in some cases, conveyor systems take them to a collection area. The straight tube cutoff machine straightens and feeds tubing to a very precise length and then cuts it with a rotary system, again with no chips or burrs. Straightening of the tube is performed on a two-plane roller system and the feed performed by a hitch mechanism. Other machines in the tube processing category include the return bender, sizing and ring machines for sizing the ends of the return bends and installing the brazing ring, and a cleaning machine. Return bends are shorter than hairpins and designed to determine the refrigerant circuit of the coil. One major difference between the return bend production process and the hairpin manufacturing is the cutting operation. Return bends are cut with a saw creating chips that need to be cleaned from their interior. This cleaning operation is performed with a vibratory system that includes a burnishing media and a degreasing solution and must be done prior to the application of the solder rings. The uncoiling system of the hairpin bender, the straight tube cutoff machine, or the return bender supports level long coils of copper in sizes ranging from 100 kilo to 500 kilograms or more, depending on various factors. For instance, the overhead spiral uncoiling system allows the use of a very large and heavy coil, but is generally limited to 10 millimeter diameter tubing or smaller. Preparation of the fins for the next step of the process includes removing precision stacks of fins from the fin line and transporting them to the lacing area. Stacks of fins are shown in the left-hand picture of this slide. The number of fins in each stack is controlled by a counter on the press. The fins are stacked onto long pointed rods to maintain the alignment between each fin and the stack. The positioning of these stacking rods to the fin being produced by the die is extremely important and is shown in the right hand picture. Removal of the fins is still generally performed manually. However, there are stacker designs that can make this job easier. For instance, an elevator system can be used to lift finished stacks to a height that facilitates their removal by factory personnel. This is important because the completed stacks can be quite heavy and the fins themselves are very fragile and, and minimizing the handling will help eliminate deformed and unusable fins at the top and bottom of the stack. Damaged fins also interfere with the manual lacing of the tubes into the stacks, making it a very time consuming and tedious operation. Baroque is presently engaged in some research and development programs to study how to completely automate both the removal of the stacks and the lacing of the tubes. The actual lacing process varies from client to client, depending on sizes of the coils being produced and relative locations of the fin line and hairpin benders. The lacing tables are usually produced locally and their design is very dependent on the internal manufacturing process. The proper number of fins is placed on a smooth, 
flat table, usually with one raised edge for alignment. The collars are usually oriented, so they are directed upwards in the final assembly. The operator performing the lacing process then places the tube sheet for the bottom of the coil into position. For clarification, a tube sheet or end plate is a heavier plate located at the top and bottom of the coil to serve as a support or mounting bracket for the heat exchanger coil in the final assembly. The lacing person then begins to insert hairpins into the coil in a predetermined sequence. Due to the orientation of the fins, the hairpin enters the bottom of the collar first. After the lacing is complete and the tube sheet or end plate has been added, the heat exchanger coil is ready for the expansion portion of this process. At this point, the fins and tubes are loosely assembled and create a good, strong mechanical fit between the tube, fins, and tube sheets. An expander bullet or ball is pushed down the length of the tube. This bullet and its relation to the tube and fins are shown in the left side of this slide. The expander also accurately establishes the length between tube sheets and properly forms a cup or bell at the open ends of the tubes to allow the placement and brazing of the return bin. A fairly standard design of a cup is shown at the right side of the picture. The bell design and placement is important because the relation between the bell and the return bin inserted into it determines the quality of the final brazed joint. Excessive variation can result in leaks. Now that we have introduced the various machines that are used in the manufacturing process of a heat exchanger, let's discuss points concerning the introduction of small diameter copper tubing. The techniques are essentially the same, making this integration more of a transition rather than a completely new technology. Returning to the beginning of the four basic areas of heat exchanger coil production, let's talk about the process of transiting to smaller diameter tubing. We'll begin once again with the fin line and die. Studying the opportunity to use smaller diameter tubing will allow your coil design group to optimize the design of the entire heat exchanger coil for higher and more efficient performance. Government regulation and more aggressive competition are a constant inducement to consider new fin configurations, such as smaller pattern and new fin surface enhancements. As mentioned earlier, because heat transfer engineers are always under pressure to maximize the overall design of the heat exchangers, reducing the diameter of tubing is often accompanied by other fin specification changes. If these modifications include making the pattern more dense and changing the enhancement between the holes, it will require a new fin die. And depending on the tonnage or the options, may also involve purchasing a complete new and larger fin line. If attempting to use an existing fin line, the smaller pattern may allow more rows in the same size of die, increasing the production properties of the whole system. These efficiency and material cost savings can be significant and should be evaluated carefully in your discussions concerning new coil designs. The coil design engineer will need to be aware of and account for possible collar height limitations due to the smaller diameter and more dense pattern design because there is simply less material for the forming process. This can be solved through die design, changing the material thickness and temper, and quality and quantity of lubricant. At the suction unit, more accuracy for the location of the fins and the positive placement of them in, onto the stacker rods will be required because the pattern holes in the fins are smaller and the small stacker rods are more subject to vibration. For instance, the stacker unit may need to be retrofitted or designed with some mechanism that actually pushes the fins away from the surface of the suction sheet and onto the points of the stacker rods. In conjunction with the stacker unit, the design of the stacker and its tooling should facilitate efficient, uninterrupted production and minimize handling damage. The base of the stacker must be designed to isolate the vibration generated by the press from the stacker rods, and yet it must be rigid enough to support large and relatively dense completed stacks of fins. Both of these criteria help maintain the proper alignment between the incoming fin and the stacker rod. 
to further enhance their alignment and to facilitate movement of the fin down the rod to the top of the stack, a specially designed tip should be provided on the stacker rod. Now let's switch again from fin production to tube processing, especially as it pertains to the hairpin bender. Depending on the condition of the machine and the age of its controls, one may be able to retrofit an existing hairpin bender for 5 mm microgroove micro copper hairpin production. This should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis because there are many factors to be considered, possibly even requiring an inspection by Baroque to determine if the machine can be considered for conversion. When working with any small diameter tubing, tooling will need to be maintained to a higher degree of accuracy. The small mandrels and mandrel rods, for instance, are much more fragile, and care will need to be taken to ensure their alignment and quality. The small diameter tube will be more susceptible to handling damage, both as the raw state and as finished hairpins. This can usually be alleviated by proper operator training and the use of support fixtures. For example, an overhead uncoiling system allows the use of larger coils of tubing, minimizing handling damage of the coil stock, longer interrupted, I'm sorry, longer uninterrupted production lines, and a higher percentage of uptime for the machine. The straight tube cutoff machine usually requires little in the way of retrofitting for the introduction of 5 mm tubing. However, the cycle time of the machine may need to be slowed slightly to help prevent deflection of the tube during the feeding portion of the process. New machines should be equipped with more sophisticated controls and an electrically driven servo motor feed that can better monitor acceleration and deceleration during the feed process to minimize this deflection. The servo motor that provides the power to operate the feed also allows the exact positioning of the tooling for highly accurate and repeatable tube lengths and quick and easy setups for length changes. Now let's look for a minute to how the machines at Baroque Tool incorporate new designs, options, and techniques provide for the successful and efficient introduction of 5 millimeter micro groove copper tubing into your process. These were developed from our previous experience of helping the industry continually move from larger to smaller diameter tubes as designs and efficiency requirements evolved. While each advancement introduce, introduces its own variant of problems, the result has been a more efficient and accurate process, providing a higher quality heat exchanger. Obviously, more compact coil designs also allow a greater control of raw material costs. There are many ways that machinery builders can modify or prepare new machines for the processing of 5 millimeter copper tubes. Here's a picture of a hairpin bender that is specially designed for a small diameter application. It has a smaller footprint, higher production rates, and lower setup times than previous models. Another major innovation in new hairpin benders is a stretch straightening system to ensure the legs of the hairpin are the best possible to enhance the lacing process. This replaces the roller straightening system found on previous benders, and initial reports indicate hairpin leg length control is markedly improved. The straight tube cutoff machine has been redesigned to incorporate an electrical servo motor powered belt feed system and new controls to provide better monitoring of the acceleration and deceleration rates and also to maximize its production capabilities. Without these new controls, small diameter and thin wall copper tubing can deflect under the strain of the feed process, resulting in tubes that are not straight or, in extreme cases, simply buckle, causing scrap and downtime. Setup times are greatly reduced because a series of lengths can now be programmed through the operator interface and the machine can perform these changes unattended. The most common problem with stackers is the fin handling damage that takes place when the lacing personnel manually remove the stack of fins from the stacker, resulting in deformed fins at both the top and bottom of the stack. These are then removed and discarded. In answer to that and other stacking issues, Baroque Tool has designed and built a prototype fin harvesting system that provides a number of advantages over conventional fin stackers. A few of these points are 
reduce pin handling damage, continuous press operation, no waiting for a stacker to rotate or shift when the stack is complete, an uninterrupted supply of fins, a more ergonomic stack position, and it could even support an automatic tube lacing system. Due to certain proprietary designs, applications for this system should be discussed with a Baroque representative. The vertical expander design has been upgraded to include specific options for the production of heat exchanger coils with 5 mm or 7 mm tubes. These options become especially important as the length of the coil, the between tube sheet dimension, gets longer. These longer coils are more subject to misalignment and collapse during the expansion process unless proper steps are observed. One option is a tube alignment device to mechanically guide the bullets, or the expanding balls, into the open ends of the hairpins. This helps prevent damage to the ends of the tubes, such as nicks or splits. It also helps maintain the position of the tubes for the belling process, thus ensuring higher quality brazing joints. We have improved enclosure technologies to better maintain straightness of the coil during the expansion process. Controlled movement of front and rear enclosure plates allow them to start the expansion cycle closer to the top of the coil, helping to maintain orientation and straightness. Note the top of the expander in the picture, where you can see a programmable expander rod selection device to provide a fast and accurate method of changing the number of rods being used. There is also a floating rod holder system to provide for the production of one plus one heat exchanger coils that are used in condensers and are required to be formed into various shapes. Baroque is also investigating and testing various alternative non-mechanical methods to help address the inherent limitation of compressive expansion. As a quick addition to our presentation, we show our all-electric coil form machine designed to bend condenser coils into L, U, or box shapes without damage to the inside radius. This allows even heat transfer dis distribution over the entire face area of the coil. The machine in the picture is completely electric and maintains extremely well-controlled positioning for highly accurate and repeatable bending. And this allows easy assembly into the final air conditioning unit. We'll return you to John for the remainder of this discussion. We'll rejoin the presentation for the question and answer session. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to thank Ned Halet and Randy Seibel and the entire team at Burrow Tool. There is little argument that Burrow Tool is a world-renowned authority on coil production equipment, and they've been setting the standard in this area for many years. And with their new innovations, I'm sure they'll continue to do that for a long time to come. It was terrific to have that level of expertise available for this webinar, and the International Copper Association truly appreciates their help. Ned and Randy will stay on the line to help answer questions in a few minutes, but I'd like to say at this point that whenever we engage in a discussion about production machinery, it's important to remember that the conditions and priorities can be very different from one plant to another. Although the same processes take place at every coil manufacturing plant, the configuration of that equipment and the level of automation can vary. And the reasons behind these differences, well, they range from how high the production rate is to how much space is available in a plant, or even particular in-house specifications that emphasize a certain aspect of coil production that's especially important to one company. The bottom line, is that a close partnership with production machinery builder is a key component to successfully meeting your coil production goals. And we've seen here how Burrow Tool has been able to modify their equipment so that coil manufacturers can successfully implement small diameter microgroove tubes. So the equipment solutions for microgroove tubes are real and they're available and they're being used more and more every day by the air conditioning and refrigeration industry. Throughout our industry, manufacturers and suppliers of air conditioning and refrigeration systems are considering options that optimize performance and cost. And when you're considering a choice between materials, such as copper and aluminum, 
tube designs also, such as flat versus round, it's a good idea to take a look at these important factors. Corrosion, I'll look at both internal and external. You want to remember that copper has a long history of meeting corrosion requirements. You might also remember that some metal oxides are essentially the abrasive material we use in sandpaper. So this could, of course, be detrimental inside an air conditioning or refrigeration system. Pressure drop, both on the air side and refrigerant side, is something that can increase in designs with smaller diameter tubes. So heat transfer engineers have been managing pressure drop in newer designs by paying attention to design factors such as spin density, tube geometry, and tube circuitry. And we looked at this in some detail during our last webinar. Engineers have considerably more options with round tubes, and this gives them an advantage when designing heat exchangers over new requirements. When it comes to serviceability, technicians around the world favor copper tubing. And in evaporator applications, round tubes have definite advantages over flat tubes when it comes to shutting water. Coils made with small diameter microgroove tubes can save dramatically on refrigerant charge. And there are case studies we can provide that give more details on reducing refrigerant. Manifolds that are usually required for flat tubes have to be filled with refrigerant, and this can be costly. Many of us are already familiar with the increasing requirements for energy efficiency and the push to use refrigerants that are less damaging to our atmosphere. The microgroove technology we discussed today is allowing manufacturers and distributors to meet these demands. So in conclusion, let me quickly review these basic benefits that are related to small diameter copper microgroove tubes. Microgroove tubes allow for energy efficient designs. They allow manufacturers to use less material and less refrigerant. And the coils they produce are proven, durable products with a history of success behind them. Small diameter microgroove tubes allow engineers the flexibility to design for a wide variety of operating conditions. And this is a manufacturing process that's proven, it's economical, it's robust, and it's familiar to the entire industry. And finally, this process is supported by a supply chain that's very well established with manufacturing distribution centers worldwide. Before we begin answering questions, I just want to remind everyone once again to visit the microgroove.net website where you'll find archived webinars, technical information, and you can also leave questions there. And we will respond to questions that come in through this website. And for equipment-related inquiries, visit burroak.com. Thank you for your attention. And at this point, I'd like to turn things back to our moderator, Kyle, for questions and answers. Thanks again. Great. Uh, thank you both for a great presentation. Uh, presentation. And uh, like you said, now we have some time to answer some questions. Um, let me uh, let me knock some of these out here. Um, the first one, you said there was data to show how much refrigerant can be saved with microgroove tubes versus aluminum aluminum microchannel. Where can I find that? Well, this is John, and um, if you go to the microgroove.net website and you look at the lower left left hand side of the opening page there, you're going to see a box that says overview, and next to that. Uh, there's another box that uh, is titled Technical Materials. And in the overview box, you'll be able to see webinar on demand. And uh, the webinar about boosting energy efficiency has a really nice chart um, for the end of that webinar. And that compares microgroove coils to microchannel aluminum coils. And uh, it shows comparisons from several different manufacturers there. And then also in the uh, Technical Materials box, you can click on a button that says less refrigerant, and there's a paper there from Medea on this subject. And if there's more questions, um, don't hesitate to contact us because we can supply uh, additional information aside from that. Okay, great. This one is uh, next question is from Rick. What wall thickness 
do you typically have on condenser two? Uh, this is Ned Halet. Um, that would depend a little bit on the diameter of tube that we're talking about. If we're talking uh, um, condenser tubes for normal refrigerant, um, 0.5 uh, wall or slightly less, maybe in a 3 h diameter, uh, and I'm talking about inner groove tubes uh, here, uh, for, for 5 millimeter and 7 millimeter, I would predict that uh, it's probably a 0.4 uh, wall thickness, and that's total wall thickness uh, from the from the outside diameter to the point of the, the the top of the point of the groove of the uh, um, point there, because uh, you know, a lot of people talk about average wall thickness, and whenever you talk about tooling for a hairpin bender or for an expander, we always talk about the maximum wall thickness, the the overall wall thickness. So that'd be the bottom wall plus the height of the uh, the height of the groove. So uh, generally for, for uh, 3H, it's 0.5, maybe a little less now, uh, but for 7 millimeter, I think it's 0.4. All right, here's another question. I have heard that tubes can be expanded with pressure. He only talked about mechanical expansion. Do you have any information about pressure expansion? We are actively pursuing pressure expansion as an alternative. Um, we are a little early in the in the process. Uh, we have tested uh, copper tubes under this uh, application, and that has been successful. Uh, but I, I hurry to say that that's a prototype. Um, the one advantage that we see to pressure uh, expansion that we are particularly interested in is the lack uh, or the elimination of damage to the enhancements. Uh, that you always find with a uh, mechanical type expansion. Uh, however, are we ready to discuss a production uh, model for that? Not quite, but we are getting very close. So stay tuned. I think uh, uh, within, within this year, I believe we'll be, be able to actively, actively discuss this. Okay. Here's another question. This one's from Kevin Wood. Does it have to be made of copper as copper is stolen all the time? Well, no. Uh, you know, they're, obviously copper is a, a prime target. It's easily transportable. Uh, it's easy to find. Um, every uh, abandoned house has a good supply of it. But um, it, we do recommend uh, that the copper tubing be uh, uh, maintained under some under some watch, uh, behind uh, fence, that sort of stuff. Because it, it, quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, it is very it is very transportable. It's easy to find and it's easy to carry. Hey, this one's from Gary Williams. Are these coils being used with R410A? And if so, what is the burst pressure pressure of these inner these thinner coils? Uh, this is John Hipshin. They uh, they are being used with uh, with refrigerant R410A. Um, off the top of my head, I, I don't know uh, the burst pressure, but I do know that uh, that whatever it is, they're meeting it with uh, with small diameter copper tubes. And um, in fact, I don't really know of a refrigerant right now that cannot be used with uh, small diameter copper tubes, and that would include um, the propane. I believe it's 290 and, um, and carbon dioxide as well. All right, here's another question. What is the effect of the expander to the microgrooves inside the tube? The, if we're talking about mechanical expansion, which is what I've presented here today, uh, it does have a reduction effect on the microgroove. It is not completely, it is not by any means completely uh, um, wiped, uh, wiped clean, but uh, there is there is some reduction uh, to the to the top. If 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 we were to make an educated guess to the the reduction in overall height, it's probably about 30 percent of the of the micro groove would be uh, eliminated. Alrighty. How hard is it to build coils with 5 millimeter tubes if we have older equipment that was designed for 3 8 inch tubes? If we have to modify our existing system, 
how expensive will it be? Well, it it, it can be. Uh, it part of this going to be um, Kyle on the um, the age of the equipment and some of the options on it. The the fin die, of course, uh, would not be reusable. You'd have to buy a new fin die uh, for uh, now. Can you put can you put a new fin die into an old fin press? The answer is yes, probably. Again, uh, if if uh, we were to get some of the specifications like serial numbers of the equipment, uh, we could uh, make some really good um, estimations on what it would cost, uh, what option would have to be added. Uh, and and your likelihood of success. So yes, if you have existing equipment, uh, your opportunity there is greatly increased. Number and there's a couple and there's a couple of other things that really need to be discussed there. The operators, for instance, uh, would would probably not need to be completely retrained. Uh, there are some things with smaller diameter tubes that uh, will require a little bit different handling, that sort of thing. But the technique, the production of fins is essentially the same. The operation of the hairpin bender is essentially the same. The operation of the expander, again, uh, is, is pretty much the same. So you're not going to have to re-educate people. But are you going to have to look at the machine itself and determine if it if it has been maintained properly, uh, if the, particularly the expander, if the enclosures are uh, still maintained to a good alignment, all that is going to be very important when going to five millimeter, but well within um, uh, a range of study. So it, 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 can we look at it? Most definitely, yes. All right, great. Here's an, uh, another question. This one's from Jeffrey Morgan. What patterns do you suggest for five millimeter tubes? Uh, and again, this is Ned Halet. Uh, that is an excellent question. And the reason for that is every coil design person in the world thinks he has uh, his, his favorite pattern. Now at the moment, um, in an English version, I'm gonna say three quarters between holes is about right. We've been going, we've been looking at some smaller patterns than three quarters, somewhere around 15 millimeters. However, you have to be pretty careful when, when going that small, you have to be careful about other types of tooling. For instance, bending a hairpin, a five millimeter hairpin on 15 millimeter centers can be a bit problematic. Um, so I would, and again, your heat transfer characteristics are gonna to have to be checked. I would suggest you find a decent uh, uh, laboratory to help you with some sort of modeling because the way the air flows around uh, a five millimeter tube and how it, how it turbulates uh, has a direct relation on the size of this pattern. At the moment, we are looking at something right around or a little bit less than three quarters of an inch in some of our uh, prototype work. Okay, great. Thanks for the answer. Uh, here's another one, Kendall Carter. Is there an estimated savings case study that indicates savings percentage, material plus labor, for, for transitioning to smaller diameter microgroove tubing? Uh, this is John Hipshin. Um, there, there are case studies that, uh, that have shown material savings, and some of them have shown rather dramatic uh, savings. Um, but it depends from situation to situation what uh, which coil you're starting with um, when you're optimizing a design. So uh, I would refer once again to the uh, the microgroove.net um, website and uh, and look under the technical materials and also the, again that last webinar um, went through a lot of detail on uh, on cost modeling. And, um, and if you contact us directly, at, uh, you, you can contact us through the microgroup.net website. We would be happy to, uh, to do additional work you know, on that particular situation and, um, and help you out with, uh, with the cost model. Sounds good. Uh, next question up. 
What is the best way to move small diameter tubes from the hairpin bender to the lacing area? Uh, part of that, Kyle, is is uh, my next question as as a sales guy would be, all right, how far do you want to move them? Um, I would recommend number one, if you're if you're already bending three eighths or seven millimeter tubes, you've already noticed that seven millimeter tubes don't handle as easily as three eighths tubes. Uh, if you have any kind of length, uh, if you pick them up in the middle, they bend, they dent easily, that sort of thing. I would suggest personally, I would suggest that you quickly take them away from the hairpin bender. In other words, um, don't let them build up into a big uh, stack or group uh, and put them into a box or a rolling cart or something where they're more protected, uh, something that also holds them straighter. If, if, you, if you allow those in a normal hairpin production where they come down a, a, a slope and into a catch basin, um, if you allow a, a large number of those to um, get uh, to to accumulate, uh, they're they're harder to separate, and in the process of separating them at the lacing station, they become bent. Also, this uh, will afford you some uh, opportunity to look at automation, uh, particularly on that uh, new hairpin bender that I showed a slide of earlier. Um, that is very open at the bending area and allows for some uh, possibility of automation on getting those hairpins away, finished hairpins away from that hairpin bender. Uh, that, that can all be discussed uh, here at Baroque Tool. All right. Uh, Tim has a, a question here. Can 5 millimeter tubing be expanded as easily as 3 eighths or 7 millimeter? Well, the actual expansion forces are not that much different. That's true. But but when he says easier, I have to be a little bit careful um, because obviously uh, the location of the tube uh, in relative to the to the tooling coming down the bullets as we call them in our in our presentation uh, that the alignment is much more critical in a for a five millimeter application than a three eighths application uh, alignment uh, support of the coil much more critical. Obviously, uh, the, the 3H tube is stronger in a column strength, uh, and some misalignment might be tolerated. On a 5 millimeter coil, you can't do that. Any misalignment uh, during the expansion process, and uh, um, the coil is going to bend. So, so force-wise, the actual application of force, it, there's not that much difference. But maintaining accuracy of the tooling uh, is much more critical in five millimeters than three eighths. Okay, looks like we have time for uh, one more question. We've had a lot of good ones here today. Let me uh, grab one. Um, you said there was data to show how much how much refrigerant can be saved with microgroove tubes versus aluminum microchannels. Where can I find that? They're asking. Um, the data to show how much refrigerant can be saved. Uh, once again. Um, I would uh, refer to uh, to the last webinar that we did, and again, that can be found on the microgroove.net website. Um, and uh, on that opening page, it, uh, it would be in the uh, in the overview section and webinar on demand. Um, and again, if uh, if there isn't uh, enough information there, um, give us a, give us a call or leave us an inquiry, and we can certainly get back. Sounds good. Uh, this concludes today's webinar. Please join me in thanking our presenters for their excellent presentation, as well as our sponsors, International Copper Association and Microgroup. As you exit today's webinar, please take a couple minutes to complete our survey. We strongly welcome your detailed comments to help us serve you better. If you have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at bnpmedia.com. We appreciate your time and hope you have found this webinar to be a valuable experience.